Thanks for joining us for the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Josh Balk on this episode. Josh Balk is the Vice President of Farm Animal Protection at the Humane Society of the United States. In addition, he is a co-founder of Hampton Creek, now Eat Just Inc., a food technology company famous for producing the Just Egg product. Prior to working at the Humane Society of the United States, Josh is known for his work at Compassion Over Killing. He has been an advocate for animals for almost 20 years. In this episode, we discuss the future of food and why we need to start making radical shifts in the way we consume. Let's jump right in. Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Alex, thanks for having me. Josh, please tell us a little bit about your background and actually when you started working to help animals. I think just like you and your listeners, I cared about animals since I was a kid. I grew up with dogs. There was a a big dog who was the love of my life at the time. Uh, His name was Hector. He was a St. Bernard to me the size of a bear. And I loved him more than anyone else in the whole world. Don't tell my brother or my dad about that one. But (laughs) he meant everything to me. He was the one who was really the gateway of me understanding the care and compassion for other creatures. So when I started caring about him, I started watching videos about wildlife, eventually saw a documentary about how animals are raised and killed in food production. And I just made that connection. I made the connection as to why do I care so much about Hector, my St. Bernard, but ignore the suffering of these other animals who could feel the same pain who had the capacity to suffer like Hector. And that's when I started to really explore personally the impact that I'm making beyond my own house to animals. And that's when I started pursuing volunteer opportunities, internships, and move along the path of trying to help animals as much as I could and dedicate my life to that pursuit. I think that story really hits home. My childhood best friend had a golden retriever named Chloe. I remember like this certain time I would be there over at his house every day in the summer and seeing Chloe was like seeing another friend because they they are our friends. They're our family in many ways. And definitely that connection is very strong. It is strong. And and you said it when you, especially when you're a kid, it's almost like when our souls are the purest, we do look at them as our friend and they are our friend. They look to us as their friend. And for those who are in our house, you know what? Hector was my brother. He was a a big furry slobbery brother, (laughs) but he certainly was my brother and he was treated as a member of the family. And the good news for animals is not just you and me feeling this way. Polls show that the vast majority of Americans who have animals in their household view their pets as members of their family. And so I think that's just a common theme that we share as Americans. And that gives me hope, a lot of hope for the future because we feel that way. Great. And so we'll jump into a little bit more of that advocacy that you started at a younger age shortly through the show. But I wanted to jump in and ask you about your origin story, because you're a co-founder of Eat Just, which is known for the Just Egg product. And in the cultured meat world, they are known for the cell-based meat chicken nugget. And so what's your origin story there? How did Hampton Creek, which is, I believe, what it was originally called, really get started? You know, Hampton Creek was named after my other St. Bernard who came later in my life, Hampton. And so it all trickles back to my dogs. And what happened was this, Alex, is that at the time, and I still am at the Humane Society of the United States, and I was working with food companies on their animal welfare policies, trying to get the big egg users, like the big grocery stores, food service companies, restaurant chains, and food manufacturers to move away from using eggs from caged chickens. Most eggs come from chickens confined in cages that are about the size of our home microwave. And imagine six to eight chickens in a cage the size of your home microwave, and it's just a, a world filled with suffering. And so a way to reduce the suffering is to have major egg buyers switch to cage-free. And so I was meeting with General Mills based uh, in Minneapolis to try to persuade the company to switch to cage-free eggs. It was a great meeting in a big boardroom, dozens of high level staff were at the meeting, people nodding their heads as, hey, absolutely, this is the right thing to do. All said the right thing. All I truly believe in their hearts, believe the right thing was to switch to cage free. But at the end, they said they just felt so constrained because of cost and supply. 
to do that right thing and switch to cage free that they can only do about 2% of their eggs and shift them away from cage chickens. And I left so deflated because and this is a company filled with good people who I'm sure are against animal cruelty. I'm sure didn't go to business school and join General Mills to support cruelty to animals, but they just felt like the system in place was just so aligned against them to make any real changes. So just reflecting on that in an airplane on the runway, leaving from Minneapolis, being stuck because of a winter storm, it just hit me, hey, what would it look like if we could create plant-based foods that have the same taste and texture and profile as eggs, only it was more affordable and there wasn't supply chain constraints. And you know what? It's probably healthier and better for climate change, certainly better for the animals. It made me think, you know what? Companies like General Mills would go for it. And so I reached out to my best friend also named Josh Tetrick, someone who I grew up with. and. I pitched him the idea. He wanted to start a company and he went through a bunch of kind of iterations in his mind of what companies could be. And after going through the idea of a plant-based company, I just remember a pause. And to me, the pause was the big deal because Josh is extremely witty and he is a quick retort for everything. The fact he paused made me feel that I was onto something. And from that moment on, we pursued the idea of creating a company. That's how Hampton Creek was formed and then eventually became just. Great. And now definitely a staple in my refrigerator and I think many other people's refrigerators too. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm happy you enjoy it. What's your favorite products? Is it the liquid egg or is it the frozen egg patty? What is it for you, Alex? So I haven't tried the frozen egg patty, although I have been looking for it. But one thing that I've been trying to do, and it's actually been taking quite a long time, but I've been trying to make a very legit omu rice, like the Japanese oh omu gosh. rice yeah. with the just egg. And so I'm getting pretty close. It's still very hard just to make it regardless of what kind of egg or egg replacement you're using. But I'm hoping that's my next big win in the kitchen. Good for you. I'll, I'll be cheering you on. Most lay people out there who are working in the kitchen are just hoping for a good scramble, but you're going pretty fancy. I'm impressed. <laughs> so that's fascinating. And I think it's really exciting to look back at that and say, let's change the system. And when Josh Tetrick speaks and gives presentations, you definitely see that passion and the drive. So that's very cool. Now, when we're talking about the animal agriculture industry needing change, it definitely looks like things are changing, especially for chickens and when it comes to eggs. But what do the numbers, and maybe not necessarily specifically to egg, but just in general, what do the numbers actually look like? We're seeing meat consumption has been on a rise. And although there's exciting statistics about plant-based meats and plant-based meat sales definitely going up, especially amongst the pandemic and with the recent IPO of Beyond, is it really significant? Is it something that 10 to 15 years from now we'll look at and say, wow, this industry took a complete 180? And I see that with milk, right? With dairy-free milk, soy milk, oat milk. Are we going to see that with meat or, for example, egg as well? I do think we're going to see it. What we are seeing now is the very early stage of it happening. Like you, I'm excited about seeing things like the Beyond IPO. I love seeing that Impossible is in every Burger King. I love going into mainstream grocery stores and seeing plant-based meats being sold. And I remember many years ago, these are products that were only sold in local co-ops and eventually into Whole Foods. But now the fact that Walmart and Costco and Safeway and Kroger had these pro has these products now shows how far we've come. So we've made a lot of progress and I'm thrilled how it's going. We shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that progress that we've made has made the type of impact I think we're hoping it would lead at this moment in time. I think it will, but not yet. The reason why I feel pretty confident that the path is the right one to go on, though, is because of your example about plant-based milks. When I w became vegan back in 2001, about it, almost 20 years ago now, trying to get you know, soy milk, I had to go to these natural food stores. And sometimes they were so incredibly bad, I would just resort to putting orange juice in my cereal. That's how disgusting they were. The fact that over the years, not only have they become really delicious, 
But they've, we've gone well beyond just soy milk now. Obviously, there's almond milk and there's coconut milk, and there are many varieties of plant-based milks. And those varieties are in the dairy section of mainstream grocery stores. That is when the shift happened in the milk space is when there are more varieties and they're put in the dairy section. And when we're seeing that the fluid milk market has been dramatically reduced in the United States, it's for that reason. We are seeing beginning of that phase in the meat section where in many mainstream grocery stores, we are starting to see plant-based meat in the actual meat section. And now why is that important? Because most people in the country aren't like me. They're not vegan, let alone vegan for 20 years. They're everyday, ordinary people who have probably been eating meat, eggs, and dairy since they were a kid. Probably really good people who probably don't want to eat unhealthy, probably don't want to support greenhouse gas emissions causing you know, climate change, probably don't want to support animal cruelty. Yet because of something that has just been instilled because of habits since childhood, that's what so many folks are to no fault of their own supporting. However, by actually having products available in the places where ordinary Americans buy their food helps everyday people do the right thing. And we saw it with milk, we're gonna see it with plant-based meat. I would put a lot of money on the fact that in the years to come, we're going to start seeing the number of animals who are being raised and killed reduced for this very reason. I think uh, another kind of great example of changing that mindset is Thanksgiving. We're always thinking about having turkey for Thanksgiving, yet if you replace the turkey with either a plant-based roast or just something else, then after you have a great meal, you never think twice about the fact that, oh, there was no turkey. And I think that's something maybe I'm excited to see this year or next year is that more people will be switching away from Turkey, for example. I certainly hope so. And birds are the most abused land animals on the planet and specifically turkeys and chickens. They're raised you know, inside these massive factory farms, windowless sheds, no outdoor access, packed wing to wing genetically manipulated to grow so big, so fast, by the end of their short life, they can barely even move. Chickens, as an example, they're killed at just over 40 days. So all chicken meat in the country comes from birds who were killed when they're chicks. And that's where chicken meat comes from. And so I really hope and I expect our country to move away from eating as many turkeys and chickens as we are now. I think you're right, is that doesn't come to the point that people want to see turkeys or chickens abused. It's just a habit. I was raised eating turkey for Thanksgiving, like I'm sh sure you are, Alex, and most of the, of the people listening. But the more opportunities there are for everyday, ordinary people to try delicious and convenient plant-based meat, the more opportunities are going to be taken up to take a step forward in creating a more humane, healthy, sustainable food supply. And, and I feel pretty good about the future. I, I really do. So tell us a little bit about the work that the Humane Society of the United States does and the work that you do there. Humane Society of the United States takes on the big issues for animals. And what we do is take on big industries, big interests, pass laws, we create corporate policies, we wage massive campaigns. We take on the interest in industries that requires a large organization with a lot of firepower to do. If you think about issues related to whether it's animal testing for cosmetics, whether it's giant puppy mills, especially in the Midwest, or the cockfighting industry across the country where tens of millions of chickens are wrapped up in this gruesome illegal effort. And if you look at factory farming, where my team is focused on, it can't be a small organization with a few people that can take on these massive entities out there that are abusing collectively billions of animals. It takes a Goliath, and we're the Goliath to take them on. I lead the farm animal section, and what we want to do is Twofold. One, eliminate the worst practices in factory farming, such as the caging of egg laying chickens in small cages, mother pigs in small cages, baby veal calves in small cages, while 
also reducing the number of animals overall who are even being raised and killed in food production. So if we can hit that sweet spot, eliminating the worst practices and reducing the number of animals raised and killed for food, we can have a big impact when it comes to reducing overall suffering. And that's what we're all about. I wanna wake up every single morning, and so does my team, thinking, how can we have the biggest impact in our lives to reduce suffering? We think we can get it done by passing laws, by working and sometimes campaigning against major food corporations to make changes in their supply chain, while simultaneously in the food service industry especially, working with them, with our professional chefs and experts that we've hired from the industry to change their menus to focus on plant-based foods rather than animal-based foods. And so imagine going into a university or a hospital And instead of plant-based meal options being maybe 5% of the menu, imagine it being 50% of the menu. That's the type of progress we are making with this industry that represents tens of thousands of colleges, universities, K-12 schools, hospitals, even prisons and military installations. That is a high-impact way to reduce the number of animals raised and killed for food. Large scale, it's a way to reach more people than we could ever reach one individual at a time, and we're having a lot of success moving that industry towards focusing on plant-based foods. So public policy, corporate policy, and plant-based foods related to the food service industry. How closely does the Humane Society of the United States work with like-minded organizations like PETA or the Good Food Institute or the Humane League, for example? Is there a lot of collaboration between these organizations? When it comes to farm animals, a lot of organizations have their specialty. And I think it's good for animals, that there are a bunch of organizations that are more skilled at certain areas than other areas. As an example, the Good Food Institute, which I admire a lot, does a tremendous amount of work in galvanizing funding around research and investment into plant-based and cultivated meat technologies. That's just something that is not our focus, but I'm thrilled they're doing it. And so I think it's a good thing. There's a lot of organizations doing a lot of different things for animals. When it comes to collaboration, mostly collaboration comes to passing laws because that's when big coalitions can be formed. We passed a historic ballot measure in California in 2018 called Proposition 12. Now, for those listeners who aren't in ballot measure states, I grew up in Pennsylvania. It's not a ballot measure state, unfortunately. In about half the country, if an organization or even individuals collect enough petitions from actual citizens of the state, they can put a question on the ballot. So when people vote for president or senator or mayor or whomever, they can also vote on the propositions. And so California, we waged a proposition that banned the production and the sale of eggs, pork, and veal from caged animals. It was a year-long battle against big agribusiness interests. It was hard fought. There are ups and downs in this year-long campaign. We raised $13 million to be able to wage it in the most expensive state in the country to wage a statewide political campaign. And on election day, we won. We got nearly two-thirds of the vote, a political landslide, and California became the state that had the strongest law in the world for farm animals. And from there, we went to Oregon, Washington, Michigan, Colorado to pass similar laws when it came to the confinement of egg-laying chickens in cages. I bring this up to say is that when it comes to passing these historic measures, it is very helpful that there's coalitions that work together. So it's not just the animal welfare community, but also the environmental community, food safety community, sustainable farming community, working together to try to shift our legal system to provide more protection for farm animals. And hopefully we have many more laws that we're going to pass to come. To get a little bit deeper, I often get different answers for this question. And so I'd like to ask you this question of what is the difference between animal rights versus animal welfare? You know, this might be a different answer that you got also, but for me, I don't care too much. Animal welfare versus animal rights, that's kind of like a a fun thing to discuss when I'm at like a a vegan restaurant with six of my vegan friends and we kind of nerd out on animal philosophy. It's a fun thing to talk about. At the same time, when about 99% of Americans at some point are eating animal products, and most of those products came from animals who are raised 
in factory farms and killed in these industrial slaughterhouses, I don't think it matters too much to them. I think about in my own family. I'm the only vegan other than my dad. He's now uh, vegan for the last couple months. I'm so proud of him. He's 78 years old and he's making the shift. He shows never too late to make a change. But I just think about someone like my dad before uh, he's gone vegan the last couple months or my brother or other family members. They couldn't care less about animal rights, animal welfare, animal protection. They just want to be helped about eating in in a better way. If I just talk normally to people like, hey, do you care about animals? And most people in the country say yes, and they do care about animals. And w- when it comes to, hey, you want to eat a bit healthier? Do you want to eat a- in a way that reflects our values a bit more? Do you want to eat in a way that doesn't harm our environment as much? Do you want to eat in a way that doesn't harm our rural communities as much? This is just like normal ways of talking that I think resonate a lot more with ordinary Americans that we hope to bring on board versus like deep philosophical debates that I might have at a vegan restaurant or enjoy in a philosophy class. And I could be wrong, Alex, but I think that's the way to really talk about it, to to truly make caring about animals as big a tent as we possibly can have, because we should welcome everybody in it. That is definitely a good answer. And I think when there is a conversation and maybe it does get too philosophical, then it's oftentimes missing the point. And so I think we all know that there needs to be a major shift and we can make those decisions every time we eat. I think so, Alex. I I just think about it this way. The worst thing about factory farm is the best thing about a factory farm. The worst thing about a factory farm is that if you care about animals, you should be against factory farming. If you care about climate change, you should be against factory farming. If you care about small family farmers, you should be against factory farming. If you care about rural communities that are often left out and suffer the consequences of the pollution that comes from these factory farms, you should be against factory farming. If you want Americans to eat healthier, you should be against factory farming. The fact that factory farming is so bad on so many levels actually can unite us all, that we can work together to move our food system in just a better way. And when it comes to animals, and that certainly has been the driving motivational force for me, I just have to ask someone, hey, are you against animal cruelty? I think everybody would say yes. And they don't just say yes. I believe it. I truly do in their heart. And so if we can just start at that baseline that people are against animal cruelty and we talk about what then happens to animals in these factory farms that is cruel, then I think we can bring people on a journey to move in a, a good direction in a way that fits their own lifestyle, a way that fits their own past way of eating. And I think that's a way that we can truly bring people in. And we just went through a very contentious election. And in so many areas, our country is divided. But when it comes to animals, like this should be the one issue at least that everybody can agree on. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care if you're left, right, moderate, no matter where you stand, don't you want animals to have a good life. And I think almost everybody in that entire spectrum would nod their head and say, yes, great, let's work together to make sure that happens. That's why, again, I feel there's hope out there because people are good people at heart. And we just have to bridge that gap between how people feel in their heart with what is actually happening behind the scenes, behind the closed doors of factory farms. If we can bridge the gap between if food production can actually reflect our own heart, then we've made a lot of progress. And that's why we are taking these strides. We're moving forward. And I think it's just a matter of time before we make even bigger strides and change the food system forever. You're definitely motivating me right now. So we have a mutual friend, Paul Shapiro, and I think that you two go way back. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work at Compassion Over Killing? And I know that might be some time ago. It was some time ago. And what I did, it was the early 2000s, was work with restaurants in the D.C. metropolitan area to add more plant-based foods. I would go around. This is pre-YouTube. I know for some listeners, was there ever a time before YouTube? Yes, I lived that time before YouTube. (laughs) And I was in college and then eventually worked at Compassion Work Killing at the time where I would go in a van and park in a busy area of Washington, D.C., open up the side door of a van and a giant TV would come out and show factory farm footage and slaughterhouse footage. And I'd give out leaflets. And that's the way people could actually see for the first time what was going on to farm animals. So I would do that every single week. But I would also do undercover work. And so I I worked in a 
a slaughterhouse as an example. In Maryland, there's a chicken slaughterhouse and I would work in the what's called the shackling room. Your chickens are dumped on a conveyor belt. They're grabbed by the workers and forced upside down into these metal shackles. And then the shackles take them to the next slicing machine. And sadly, all while fully conscious. And what I did was not only work there, but I had a hidden camera to be able to record what was going on to these animals. And I'm proud of the work that I did with the team at uh, Compassion We're Killing. We allowed millions of people to see for the first time what actually happens. And those are moments that I'll never forget. When I worked in that slaughterhouse, the first chicken I grabbed and shackled, doing everything against who I am as a person. I I don't want to ever abuse an animal. I don't want to ever send an animal to uh, her death, especially for the arbitrary reason that her flesh happens to taste good when it's cooked. And for that reason, it's a death sentence. I don't want to ever do that. Yet being an undercover investigator, you have to if you want to actually capture what goes on. And so that first chicken who I shackled, I picked her up. Her legs were all twisted because of the genetic manipulation that's forced upon these animals. She was pecking at me, hitting me with her wings, trying to scratch me to free herself because she was so incredibly scared. And when I put her in the shackle, what hit me was that helping animals was no longer some philosophical pursuit. It was no longer some interesting thing to talk about, to debate about. It had real life consequences on whether I'm effective or not to others. And so if I'm effective, hopefully fewer animals will ever enter the slaughterhouse. If I'm not, more animals will enter the slaughterhouses. So it brought a real life tangibility to everything that I do. And that has helped color what I do in terms of the strategies I believe are most effective at helping animals. And the name of the game for me is effectiveness. Is what I'm doing, is what my team doing effective? And not only is it effective, how can it be more effective? How can we learn and grow and evolve to have a bigger impact? So that one chicken, when I was an undercover investigator, in my heart, in my mind, will live on forever to drive me to become a better advocate. I think I can draw back to that story you said about the executives and that if they had a choice, I think they would take the route where the animals are not harmed. The system is in place so they feel that way. And I I liked how you said they didn't go to business school to figure out how they could harm animals. And so it's an interesting perspective that sometimes we do things, although we might not want to do them because there is this greater picture, whether that greater picture is actually better for the world or not is a different story, but it's just an interesting way to look at. And I think that's a nice way to lead into our next question. Can you imagine a future where animal agriculture, or maybe I should say factory farming is completely abolished? Can you imagine that will happen? And It will happen. And the good news is that there are a lot of people working to make it happen. And the trajectory is that it will happen. What I am highly motivated to do is to make it happen faster. Because imagine if because of the wonderful work of whether it's the Humane Society of the United States or other animal protection organizations and or the tremendous work in the for-profit sphere with these plant-based and eventually the cultivated meat companies, because of that, imagine going forward as fast as we all can collectively. Imagine if we can speed up the process of eliminating these factory farms by two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. We're talking about billions of lives that we can save from suffering this fate. It's a situation where the ticker keeps going about how many animals are raised and killed. And imagine if we can stop that ticker and look at the future knowing that because of the work we've done, that ticker stopped in 2030 rather than 2040 or 2035 instead of 2050. That is a righteous life pursuit. That's what I feel like I'm doing in my life. That's what my team is is working to do. And I believe that at least I'm, I'm 41 years old. I'm trying to exercise and do cardiovascular movements just to be able to keep my heart pumping in a good way. 
I'm trying to eat healthy. I believe in my lifetime, I will see an end to factory farming. And I hope because of the work that my team's doing and so many others that we see it a lot sooner than it otherwise would happen. Josh, thank you. You can learn more about Josh on LinkedIn and about the Humane Society of the United States at humanesociety.org. Josh, do you have any last insights for our listeners today? You know, Alex, maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm on your show, but it seems to me your show has some really knowledgeable, intelligent, and motivated listeners. And so I'm going to just going to work off of that assumption. For everybody listening, what's important is to go out there and give things a shot. Take leaps. Wage a campaign. Wage a campaign to try to get grocery stores or restaurants that have more plant-based foods. Just try to start a company, whether it's plant-based or, or cultivated meat. You know, nothing has ever changed in society without taking risks. Never. It's never been done by being cautious. And when it comes to making the world a better place, which my guess is every single person listening wants the world to be a better place, we really can't look out. We got to look in. What can we do to do our part? And I ask everyone, go for it. And when I look at people and the success they've had, I look at those who weren't successful as highly as those who have been successful because no matter whether you are or not, it's about giving it a try. You know, there's a, a book that I'm about to read, and I know one of the quotes is that whatever we do is never going to be enough, but try anyway. Let's try. We're in this together. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your insight on the Future Food Show. Thanks for having me on, Alex. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.